wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. It's important that you pray for it because the spirit of wisdom and revelation are two different aspects of God giving you um, an open lens to what he wants you to have and how he wants you to live. So when we deal with wisdom, is more so um, the Father going to give you instruction mode. He's going to start instructing you down a direction. But revelation is where you're not only just doing something that you're instructed to do, but it's been revealed to you why you should do it. So Abram couldn't leave his father's house without revelation. Even though wisdom was revealed to him to leave the house, he needed revelation to stay away when he got away. You notice you never saw one time Abram go back to the house. Why didn't he return back to the house? Because once he left, which was the wisdom, he stayed away, which was the revelation. And then the Bible says uh, in Ephesians that uh, I pray that the Lord God of our Father will grant unto you. So it's a grant. You need access to this, like, but you have to ask for it to get it. It says the spirit of wisdom and revelation, watch. Where is it located? In the knowledge of Christ. So this means that it takes you into the brain and the thought process of King Jesus. You'll be able to read him and know what he is desiring from you. What is his good pleasure towards you? So this is just so amazing when you could um, capture this weapon to go before the father and to pray to receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. In the knowledge of Christ. Because his knowledge, he knows what is adversarial to your progress. He knows what takes away your love for him. He knows what makes you on fire for him. He knows. So imagine having a revelation of his ideas. You won't have to go through all those hard seasons, all those issues, all those problems, because you have revelation of his knowledge. You won't have to. Now, the Holy Spirit be talking to me about this, and, and it's amazing. I want to share this with you. How different your pursuits will be if you knew the future. Do you know that some people reach out for people because you don't know the future? You don't know that that person that you're reaching out to is, is, is not going to come to none avail. What if you knew the future? There was a prominent man. I, I, I don't even want to say his name because um, he's prominent and uh, he, he's in heaven now and he but he did something legendary. He had a son and he named the son after him. He was a man of God. He named the son after him. And when he went on to glory, he had already raised his son, took care of his son. His son was rich with him. He was blessed his son. He, he, everything, his son was good. His son had a good life, easy life because his dad was rich. His dad was was very high in productivity and kingdom responsibilities. But when his dad died, after some years, he started talking about his dad, saying his dad was this and that and that and that. And the Holy Spirit came to me and said, son, what if people could see the future? Because, see, as a father, it's okay for you to feed the son and, like, just take care of them, you know, necessity and stuff. But what if you knew that this was your enemy? Because you don't know. That's why it is, it is, it is angles that you take that's extra. 
Like you go over and beyond because you really can't see the future. No, no, no. Talk to me in here. If you knew what was going to happen in the future, you would treat people differently. Because you're not treating them according to the revelation of the knowledge of Christ about how you and their relationship is going to end. You're treating them according to the spur of the moment, what you feel in the moment, what you see in the moment. You're not treating them according to what you see in the future. Oh, my gosh. Saints, let me give you an understanding of this. When David raised Absalom, Absalom was his son. He enjoyed his son. They played together. He would talk with his son. They, they dust, dust and dust. But when Absalom got a big boy, when he's a man, Absalom is trying to kill his dad. David never saw this. David never saw this. So David is naive to this part of Absalom. All he knows, this is my son. I love him. I want the best for him. I want him to be great. I want something mighty for him. But his son has a demon. Now, meanwhile, God is not stopping this because David has chosen to not listen to God in some areas of his life. And he's offending God in some areas of his life. Wow. So guess what? God is not stopping Absalom from manifesting as a demon. So as you can see in two generations, both Solomon and David, they got to a point of offending God. But the difference between them and other wicked men, they were righteous because when they recognized that they was offending God, they turned. They didn't fight. They didn't defend themselves. They didn't say, you know, no, no, I'm going to stick with what I'm doing. They changed. And they got it right. But if you could see that De uh, Solomon received the impartation of wisdom, David had an impartation of wisdom. And if they miss, there is a mystery to this. How could you miss in the midst of having wisdom, anointing in you and on you. That means that the heart needs constant review. Do you know what review means? To view again. You have to look at your heart and say, am I appropriate in my focus in this season, in this moment of my life? Am I still on the right path? Did I switch? Did I go to the left or did I go to the right? Am I looking forward or am I looking back? Am I progressing or am I perversing? Reversing. Because it's possible. In Mark chapter 10, verse 30, the Lord told Peter, in verse 29, he says, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left houses and brethren and sisters and wife and children and lands or children for my sake or for the gospel that he shall receive a hundredfold now, in verse 30, in this time of houses and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution, and in the world to come, eternal life. So I, I want you to look at this. This is a real grand, explosive promise from King Jesus. Because King Jesus said something that was very revelatory. He said that the man that sows his life into me, and he makes me his only adoration. I am his only joy. Not his children. See, that's the, that's, that's the problem with some of you all. You have children and you pitch your life in the child. 
You have siblings according to the natural, and you pitch your life into siblings. That's your mistake. It's not normal to God, and it's not good. What the Lord was telling Peter, you're married. You have a wife. You have a mother-in-law. You left all those people to attend to me. I am your importance. That means that even if you find out that your wife is in the hospital, you're not going to go see her unless I let you go. You're going to come to me and acknowledge me. This is how you're operating, Peter. So I want to tell you this, attach to this mentality that you have received to love the Lord God with all your heart and soul, to sow your life and to sow everything that you have into me and make me number one. I have a reward, a cash reward to this. You'll receive a hundredfold in this life. While you're on earth, not when you transition to receive your reward in heaven, while you're on earth, I'm going to make sure that you become rich and wealthy by my mighty power. I'm going to disperse my power in your city and I'm going to cause the events that heaven has scheduled for you to come into peace and joy and comfort. Happiness and abundance. And I'm going to make this your story. Let's go to Psalm 37. Look what Psalm 37 says. Hallelujah. Saints, you know what my favorite food is in this season? <laughs> you know what my favorite food is in this season? Do you know what my favorite food is in this season? I have two favorite foods right now. Maintenance and focus. Psalm 37. Look what it says here. Look what Psalm 37 says. Psalm 37 talks about in verse 11, it says, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The meek. The meek shall inherit the earth. The meek. Let's go to Psalm 25. I want you to start reading the word of God, not to go share it with somebody else, but read the word of God because you want to feed your brain enough vegetables and enough steak and enough meat so that your brain could be fat with the power of God. And ask the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom to study Proverbs because other than the Gospels, Proverbs is a major part of the word of God that if you read it, you will understand how to be God's friend in your fruit and how to receive all of the rewards for being a, a friend of God in your fruit. You'll understand discernment. You'll understand discretion. Let's go to Psalm 25. Let's go to verse 12, it says, what is man that feareth the Lord? He shall teach him in the way that he shall choose. Oh, this is beautiful. Do you understand how, 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 how great and how clad, uh, 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 high this, 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 this uh, form of doctrine is? It says, what is he, what man is he that feareth the Lord? Okay, this man fears the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. So this man has began to become wise. It says, this man shall the Lord teach in the way that he shall choose. 
So the Lord is not giving it to this man to pick how he learns. The Lord is going to impart to him how he wants him to learn, how he wants him to grow, how he wants him to prosper, how he wants him to use his faith, his servanthood, how he wants him to use his submission. Now look at what verse um, 12, let, look, let's look at verse 9. It says, the meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. So the Bible says, the meek will he guide in judgment. Now, judgment is decision making. What do judges do? They make decisions. So the Bible is saying when somebody is meek, God mentors them on how to make correct decisions. Hallelujah. So, 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 so meek people are people that are taught correct judgment, how to judge a situation, how to make the right decision and how to respond and react to that moment the way that God wants to react. Remember I was saying while I was playing basketball, I told you many people say I love. But the minute you say I love, you're saying I God. Because God is love. So you're saying that you're in the God realm towards that person. So that means that you are led by the spirit to be everything that God intended you to be to them. So let me give you an example. Jonathan had a God realm to care about David, trust David, and be trusted by David, protect David's information, and make sure David was unharmed. And, and to not gossip about David, not betray David, but to make sure that David made it safe without Saul, his biological dad, being successful in assaulting David to kill David. Because that's what Saul was after, trying to kill him. So what Jonathan did was he became the God realm towards David, uh, uh, Jonathan did. Now, if Jonathan doesn't receive this, he becomes the satanic realm to David. So in life, you have a chance to love a person that God has put in your life or hate them. If you hate them, you receive the satanic realm towards them. If you love them, you receive the God realm and God's personality towards them. So God wanted to sow seed into Peter. And this is the realm that he offered to Ananias. Ananias rejected it, and then he taught his wife to reject it. He told his wife, I'm not going to receive the God realm towards Peter, and you ain't going to receive it either. So I'm going to train you how to not be meek. Because if you're meek, God's going to be the one teaching you. But I'm going to teach you how to reject God, how to resist God, how to hurt God, and how to defy against what he's impressing on your heart to do. I'm going to teach you how to harden your heart not to sow. What was the major thing that Ananias taught his wife? How not to sow. He didn't teach her how not to put on makeup, how not to do her hair, how not to wear Jerusalem sandals, how not to eat bread and meat at the market. He didn't teach her how not to gossip. His major doctrine to her is, I'm going to mentor you how not to be meek. I'm going to mentor you how to eat the seed. I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm going to show you how to rob God and be successful. In robbing him, I'm going to show you how to trick God to make him believe that he can't see. That you're not interested in investing in him, that you, you have other idols in your life that's more important to you. And saints. Ananias death was pinpointed on the fact that he had rejected sowing. 
It wasn't on the fact that he had ought against his brother in the church and he was fighting somebody that was going to a synagogue. It wasn't predicated on that. Before he dies, Peter says, why have you let Satan fill your heart? That you're trying to lie to the Holy Ghost. And what was the lie? The lie was about sowing a certain amount of money. He said that this all the money that he had. And he kept back the larger portion of the money for himself. Why did the Holy Ghost kill him off of that basis? It shows you how the Holy Ghost is tied into sowing in the new covenant. That it means a major big deal to him. And if the Holy Ghost would do this in response to Ananias eating the money that was supposed to be sown as seed, wouldn't you think that the Holy Ghost was speaking to Ananias to sow? So the Holy Ghost speaks to the body of Christ, the people that say that they belong to him, false and real. And the Holy Ghost speaks to them and guides them into the way that he chooses. And it's always a sowing path. Look what David said in Psalm 27, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Look what he says. He's telling the Lord, teach me how to sow. He says, teach me your way, O Lord. When have you in life asked the Lord to teach you how to sow correctly? When? And why, why haven't that been your prayer? You're a woman of God, right? You're a man of God, right? You're of God, correct? You're not of the devil, correct? So why haven't you ever asked God to give you correct sowing, anoint you to sow correctly into him? Your words, sow the right words into him, sow the right deeds. And Psalm 37, verse 11, if you look at it, what it's telling us here, it says, but the meek shall inherit the earth. Those that have been taught sowing shall inherit the earth. And they shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Wow. Do you know what it means to delight yourself in the abundance of peace? That means everything is going your way. Everything is happening the way that you want it to happen. It says that if you let the Lord teach you how to sow, how to honor him, how to invest all yourself and all that you have into his word, his presence, his body. It says that you're going to have abundance of peace and then you're going to inherit the earth. That means that what is on the earth is going to be yours. Clothes, shoes, houses, lands. And look what the Lord said in Mark chapter 10, verse 30. He told Peter, you're going to receive my response to your sowing, not in the next life. In this life that you started sowing in is where you're going to see the results of what you sowed. Wow. This is so mighty because it brings everything in totality. So when am I going to get the harvest? The Lord said, in this life, in this life, you're going to see the results of you sowing. I'm not going to let you go to heaven and say, well, I finally made it. When you go to heaven, it's going to be a continuation because you had already entered in to heaven while you were sowing on earth. Because due season is when eternal life begins in your provision. You're already now being immersed and saturated in the heavenly conditions of provision. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you understand how powerful this is? Now, you're not entering into eternal life when you leave your body to see mansions and houses and lands. No, the Lord's saying, now I'm going to bring you into houses and lands and provisions like you're already transitioned into heaven. You do season is me starting eternal life in manifestation concerning your monies, concerning your provisions, concerning your bodily health. So if you got diseases in your body, I'm going to take it away from you because you've been sowing into me and in me is healing. In me is health. In me is new body parts. So I don't care if your finger broke off and you ain't got that finger. I got a pinky that I got in the storehouse of heaven and I'll go into that body part place. I'll give it to the angel and the angel will come to earth and you'll have a pinky because do season is eternal life starting in your provisions, in your materials, in your body. And whatever you wanted, whatever you were suffering from, I'm going to remove the suffering because it's due season. And due season means that you start living in heaven. And what did the Bible say in Revelation? It said that there'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sorrow. And what did it say in Proverbs chapter 10 verse 22? It said the blessing of the Lord makes you rich and he adds no sorrow. That means that when the blessing comes, it makes you rich because now eternal life is starting in your money, in your provision, in your substance and materials. And also there's no sorrow because eternal life is beginning in your atmosphere, in your relationships. You're in the hundredfold, which means eternal life. Heaven has started for you in what you possess and what you experience and what you see and what you encounter and what you taste of and what you inherit and what you 